Good morning. It's good to see you all. I know many of you already know something of the story of how I came to be Episcopalian. I will spare you a lot of the details, but want to go back there for a second, a parable story in my own heart. I was baptized when I was 17 into an Episcopal church in South Georgia. Shout out for St. Paul's Episcopal down in Jessup. 17, as most of you know, in the Episcopal tradition, is rather late to be baptized. It was the winter of my junior year in high school. I began quickly to get involved with youth groups and even diocesan camp and conference center activities, retreat weekends. But I knew I was late to the party. Most other kids had been christened in their first year of life, had been attending Sunday school forever, had started going to camp in elementary school and took every advantage of the opportunities available to them at our local camp and conference center. I remember going with trepidation to the first youth retreat I ever went to over at Honey Creek, that camp and conference center. I was nervous about my perceived status as an outsider. I remember being greeted by a senior in high school named Bo, who took my luggage over to the dorm for me and I walked alongside him and I told him about my nervousness. I feel like I'm behind. Like everybody else knows these stories and everybody else knows these songs and everybody else knows all that weird stuff you Episcopalians talk about all the time and I don't know any of this stuff (laughs) and I don't know any of these people. I'm nervous about being so late to this. Bo, though 18, was a wellspring of wisdom when he said, it doesn't matter when you got here. It just matters that you are here. Bo knew something about the gospel, it turns out, Um, and he wanted to show it. He knew something about the heart of God, and he wanted me to know it, and that was the most important hospitality he wanted to provide to me that day. My sensitivity in that moment might have been likened to that of the workers who got there a little bit later in the day than those who had been there earlier, and upon hearing that they were all getting the same wages, knew and felt like this isn't quite fair. I know those other laborers might have been grumbling about how unfair it was, but even I could say, ooh, this doesn't seem right at all. It turns out that's how grace works, and I was just learning about it for the first time. It also turns out that though Bo's response was the correct one, it's not necessarily what had been told to him in Sunday school. It's a rare encounter with grace that we sometimes have in this world, which is a problem for a world that needs to hear about grace a whole lot more than it does, that the church doesn't always bear witness to it, but more on that later on. Instead, what we often encounter in the world is the conviction of that suspicion within us that grace indeed is not fair. And we're not wrong when we say it that way, but we sure do generally hate being right about that. Last week, we named that forgiveness and mercy, fundamental characteristics of God, are so hard for us to imagine in their abundance in God's character, right? That they are incalculable, inestimable. And so when we try to relate to each other with mercy or with forgiveness, we can at least try to do it without limit, to offer it in ways that are incalculable. The same can be said even more of God's grace, the characteristic of God, the way that God loves, that really is the foundation for God's mercy and God's forgiveness. As we encounter in the story from Jonah, which we'll again talk more about here in a minute, but I'm jumping into the hard stuff right at the beginning before we start talking about stories. What is grace and its unfairness that makes us so uncomfortable? That freely given gift to us that definitely does not match up with our sense of what we deserve. 
By definition, the generosity of the gift is really an extension of the generosity of the giver. And because perhaps of our human limitations, our limitations on our own imagination about generosity or our own generosity, we frequently try our best to reduce or change or challenge the concept of God's grace to make it into something that we can calculate or we liken it to wages, things earned, so that we can talk about the justice that we expect in dealing with one another. That is a limitation. It's a limitation that at least I feel like I can extend grace to you, but only so much. And you better not abuse the grace that I'm giving or presume upon it, or I might just take it back sometime. Oh, I'm glad God doesn't work with us that way. Philip Yancey, a celebrated Christian author, author of probably more than 30 books at this point, uh, who wrote a book called What's So Amazing About Grace, uh, writes extensively about grace. And I'm going to come back to him in a moment also. But he writes that we live in a world that is ungraceful. It's that world that presses in on us, that tries to convince us that what we should do is calculate the amount of grace that we can extend to one another. It's a world that we call a dog-eat-dog world, right? In which we hope that people will get what they deserve as long as people isn't us. We hope that there will always be somebody to blame. We hope that there will always be a way for us to determine where we stand in relationship to one another. Who's in, who's out, who's up, who's down, who's worthy, who's not. And Nancy writes that there are far too few people, including Christians, who demonstrate grace when given the opportunity. See, for even Christians, even those of us who are built around the stories of grace, we get kind of bent out of shape, or at least I do, when I start to lose my sense of how to determine who's in and who's out and who's up and who's down. It produces some anxiety in the heart and in the system, some angst, when Jesus says things like, ah, oh, the first will be last and the last will be first. And though back when I was 17, I understood myself to be one of the last, now I have to look back on it and say, oh no, I'm one of the in people. <laughs> and it makes me uncomfortable for Jesus to try to mess with that. Richard Rohr says that because we're so uncomfortable with that, some of us have done what we do when we're uncomfortable and we start to crack jokes a little bit. But most of the time when we hear the last will be first and the first will be last, we hear it as a punchline when we're at breakfast or at the Wednesday night supper and somebody cuts in front of you and you say, oh, no big deal, you know, the last will be first and the first will be last. And what an offensive thing to the gospel of Christ that we have taken a radical concept for the overturning of the whole world and turned it into a punchline and a potluck. But is that not an extension of our discomfort with the idea of God's grace? It's our own way of grumbling, maybe. Grace is a challenge. Most of us, however, myself again included, or first and foremost, don't really know when we're getting antsy about grace being extended to someone else. We're usually not aware of it. Somebody could call us out on it, that would be different. But naturally, we're not aware of it. Here's the other thing I've learned. Philip Yancey's written 30 books about it. I've preached a whole lot of sermons about it in the last 12 years. These things aren't what will change people's minds about their encounter with grace. Stories, maybe. And that's why Jesus tells a parable to his detractors and his disciples, many parables on the topic of grace. And really, if you think about it, is not the whole Bible filled with such parables, such stories for telling us about God's grace? It's almost as if the whole idea was to convince us that God's very character was one meant to, designed to, always offering generosity of love even when we can't handle it. 
One such parable is the story of Jonah. At 9 o'clock, I had to tell the whole story because we didn't read this fourth chapter that you did today. So you get the shorter version of the sermon. Good for you. It'll stop. It's probably still going to be long. Uh, you know the Jonah story from Sunday school, probably most of you, right? Jonah was going to go to Nineveh. Nineveh. Good. Well done. And he decides, no, I don't want to do that because Nineveh was the heart of the empire that hated God's people. Assyria, eventually Babylon. It's filled with bad people. I don't want to go there. I'm going to flee and go to Tarshish. Specifically because I don't want to help God spare them from their misery and destruction. And then he's on the boat and they toss him into the water. And what comes along? A big... Who said fish? <laughs> Extra credit. Carol Hathaway, well done. Not a whale. Somebody in the back, all right, good, good, good. Not a whale, a big fish in Hebrew. And the real, like, a big sea creature is good enough. It doesn't matter if it's a whale or a fish, that's not the point. But we just, how many years have we missed the opportunity? We convinced kids that this is a scene from Pinocchio. We could have been talking about a megalodon coming up and snatching Jonah out of the water, something with teeth. This could have been a good story to produce nightmares in our children. <laughs> So this big fish comes along and eats Jonah and spits him out, unfortunately for him, in Nineveh, where he preaches that they should repent, and they do. And so God says, well, I'm not going to visit upon them the destruction that was coming their way. Ooh, and Jonah's mad. <laughs> so mad that three times, it would be better if I would just die than to have to deal with you and your generosity and grace. Ugh, can't stand it. Jonah's not mad truly at God for God's generosity. Jonah is mad that God would provide that generosity or aim that generosity at other people that Jonah thought weren't worthy of it. The story of God's grace is overturning and breaking the very paradigm by which he understood who was in, who was out, who was up, who was down, who was worthy, who is not. It was shaking him to the core. Jonah is a laborer in a vineyard, deeply uncomfortable and unsatisfied with the generosity of the landowner. He signed up for the job of a prophet, expected the wages of the prophet, part of which must have been to be able to pronounce judgment upon people worthy of that judgment. And instead, he got a new job description, which was to bear witness to God's grace. That's a really good job that too few are willing to do. At the end of our parable today, we hear the response from the established workers and their complaints to the owner. We can think of it as hearing the complaint of Jonah to God. We can hear it as a complaint of established church folks like me to God. This week I've been pondering what it would be like to rewrite the ending of this parable. What else might they have said? How else might the parable have ended when the other folks who got there at five o'clock in the evening and only worked one hour, when they overheard the established workers and what they were bearing witness to? I like to think that we have some capacity within us to turn not to the God against whom we register our complaint, but to one another, our fellow workers and others in the world and say, oh, good for you. You have encountered the generosity of the landowner. This landowner is amazing. We've been working here for a long time, and you have encountered something authentic about this landowner. He's always this generous, always this willing to share what he has. We've worked for him before, and we know he's got a big heart sure do hope that you will keep coming back here and working alongside us.
Yancey, a journalist, as I mentioned, spent so much of his time listening to the stories of other people in formal and in informal ways. He would ask anytime he was traveling on a plane or on a subway or something like that, the person sitting next to him, hey, uh, I'm a journalist, just a quick question for you. I'm kind of doing an informal survey. When I say the word Christian, what do you think about? You might not be surprised to find out that very few people mentioned grace when they told him what they thought about. Judgment, crusades, hypocrisy, those were at the top of the list. Almost no one would say Christians are exemplars of grace, distributors of it. Now they may not know our stories well enough we also might not tell our stories well enough. But it's striking to consider that we have the same job description that we were talking about earlier to bear witness to this grace, and we probably have some improvement to do to be sure that others know the character of this landowner, his big heart, and the absolutely unfair way that he ensures each one of us will receive love. Nancy speaks of how creative we have to be when considering how to show grace. He tells this story about a woman who uh, was struggling to understand how she was called to fulfill that job description, how she was going to be called to bear witness to grace. She was looking for the opportunity, and then she discovered this pattern that uh, gosh, it's like every night when I have dinner, I get a call from a telemarketer. And she answered the calls, unlike me and probably most of you. She would answer the calls, and then when she got them, instead of hanging up on the person, she would hang out on the line for a minute. She said, well, it must be that God's trying to call me into a ministry with these telemarketers. And so off she went. That takes a special kind of faith, right? <laughs> She knew that the souls who were doing that must have had days filled with animosity and rejection. And so she would let them go because, you know, they're going to go down the script the whole time anyway without taking a breath. And then as soon as there was a breath, she would say, listen, I'm not going to buy whatever it is you are selling. Um, but I've just been thinking while you're talking about how hard your day must have been, how much rejection and animosity and vitriol you must have experienced, how hard that must be. And I'm a Christian, and I love to pray for people. And if you would like me to, I'll pray for you if, if there's something you want me to pray for. It was uncanny to her how many times the person on the other end of the line would burst into tears and open his or her heart and share a story and ask for prayer, sometimes at that moment. She was sure fulfilling her job description. Through the tears, she would hear the stories of where it hurts and offer prayer. Loving the unlovable, seeing the unseen, acknowledging the hurt where it is in this world, welcoming those who are late to work. These are all ways of bearing witness, of demonstrating that we really do know the landowner. We really do know the heart of God. We really do know and are pretty comfortable talking about the incredibly unfair way that God and God's immense, abundant generosity has enough love to go around. We offer it in this world freely because we've received it freely. And we know it well enough that when we see others receiving grace too, we don't lift up a complaint. We just say thanks be to God. Amen.